and the policy of inaction is not a policy we can responsibly subscribe to. So the purpose of our discussion today is to work out the right strategy for dealing with this, because deal with it we must. Former Prime Minister Tony Blair led Britain to invade Iraq in 2003. Because of his decision, he has faced endless opposition from politicians, human rights activists, and of course, the grieving parents of British soldiers who have lost their lives. In 2009, one parent came face to face with Tony Blair. His name is Peter Briley. His son was killed in Iraq in 2003. The event, a memorial service held in St Paul's Cathedral in London to remember the soldiers who had lost their lives. Peter's son was Sean, a Lance Corporal. He died in an accident just 10 days into the war. He was 28. In this documentary, we speak to Peter and Christine about their son, Tony Blair, and the Iraq War. Sean Briley was born in December 1975. He and his two brothers, Craig and Graham, and his sister, Helen, lived in Batley, West Yorkshire. Sean was the eldest. Sean was just a typical Yorkshire lad. He had a paper round. Um, he was a milk lad. He used to get up at half past four in the morning, go take the milk, drink ten pints of milk before he got home. He played football, he played cricket for, for Driglington. He played for, uh, rugby for school. Just a good all-rounder. Plenty of friends, but he, he was never a child that sort of hung on street corners. The friends used to come here and, and do whatever they wanted to do, or they used to go out to their houses. And he was never a roamer, he never roamed around streets or anything like that. I, I more or less knew where he was 24 hours a day. He became friends with a, a gypsy family that live on the estate down there, and, and one day he came home and I said, what have you been doing? He said, well, Timmy's dad said I could bring horse and cart home. He said, and I drove it down Bradford Road like a chariot. <laughs> and the police stopped me. I was only 14 at the time. And um, they used to go to um, horse fairs. And it was like a, like a race, an Irish racing buggy with this cart and this horse. And he'd let him bring it home. And he'd, he'd come down Bradford Road like at 40 miles an hour in this horse and cart. <laughs> but it was just typical Sean. He didn't have a bad bone in his body. He'd have a go at anything and everything. Nothing fazzed him. He, um, somebody said he couldn't do it, it proved he could. And he'd go do it. But if he were wrong, he would admit he was wrong. But if he were right, you couldn't budge him. If he were right, he wouldn't give in at all. But he was competitive. Sean's competitiveness carried him through school and into the combined cadet force. The aim of which, is to encourage children to join the military when they're older. Sean initially planned to join the Royal Air Force, but the recruitment officer persuaded him to join the army. When he came home, he said, I don't, I don't think I'm going back. It's, it's, it's horrible, I don't want it, I don't like it. Well, you've got two weeks to think about it while you're here. He, he, after two weeks, he said, yeah, I can't wait to go back. Sean was posted in Germany. He lived there for five years with his girlfriend and his son. Meanwhile, in the US, Tony Blair was trying to convince the world that invading Iraq was the right thing to do. If we are right, as I believe with every fibre of instinct and conviction I have that we are, and we do not act, then we will have hesitated in the face of this menace when we should have given leadership. That is something history will not forgive. Whilst Tony Blair was talking about future forgiveness, the British public was already blaming him for preparing a bloody war. But Blair stood firm against his opposition. 
Back in Germany, Sean was preparing himself for Iraq. But before he left, he went to church, something he hadn't done in a long time. He joined the choir when he was about 11. And then he got banned because he let down the vicar's tyres and I think he took a wheel off his bike or something, just for a joke, but the vicar wasn't very happy. So he told him that he was banned from choir practice for, for two weeks. And he said, if you don't let me come next Sunday, I'll never come again. And he never did. He never went back to church until about uh, six or seven weeks before they, went, they actually went to Iraq. He started going back to church in the army. Six weeks later, Tony Blair's Iraq war began. That is something history will not forgive. Twenty to two, the knock on the door, and um, I answered the door, and this gentleman was stood there with a lady, and he just said, "Are you Mrs. Briley?" And I said, "Yes." He said, "Well, I'm Captain," and he didn't get any more out because I just slammed the door. I said, "I don't want to know," and I closed the door. Anyway, Peter came down, and he said, "Who's at the door?" I said, "It's somebody from Army." So Peter answered the door and let him in, but I knew as soon as he said he was Captain, uh, and I just knew. He didn't have to tell me I'd lost my son. I knew Craig was in bed, and I knew Helen was in bed, but I couldn't find Graham, which is another brother of Sean's. And uh, I just went out into the street looking for him. But his car had gone. He'd obviously gone out to one of his friends, and it took me about two hours to find him. I rang nearly everybody in Batley to find out where Graham was. I just wanted my kids here with me. But it was horrendous. There just wasn't enough time to get round the immediate family to tell them that Sean had gone before they put it on the news. And I didn't want any of them to put the TV on and see his face pop up. And it was the most horrendous five, six hours of my life, having to tell people that Sean wasn't here anymore. I never want to do it again. And I feel so sorry for the people that are going to have to do it. When we saw him in Bryce Norton, um, Shaw, uh, Peter, Helen and Graham had already gone in to see him, but I wanted to go in on my own. And um, so they came out and, and I went in to see him and he was, he was laid there in, in the coffin and he just said, what do you think you're playing at? And I actually smacked his face to make him wake up because I didn't believe. All I, all I wanted was for him to open his eyes and look at me. Um, and he didn't. So I smacked his face and he still didn't look at me. And um, I just told him I loved him. I will always love him. But wait till I get hold of him because he told me he was coming home, but not in a box. Unfortunately, he did. It was sad, but it was it 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 beautiful. And uh, the hearse that Sean actually left, left here, both Peter and myself, actually went down in the hearse with Sean because Neil had just got a new one and the, the two seats at the back of the driver and the undertaker, 
the, the coffin was like straight down the middle and the two sides were actually two leather chairs that folded down. So Peter was sat on his left hand side and I was sat on his right hand side and we went in the hearse down to the church with our son. Sean's death had a huge impact on those who loved him and his absence was felt, especially on happy occasions such as birthday parties and weddings. We were all fairly close in age, so they shared a lot of friends. And uh, if you're going to get a bit emotional, now, I'm sorry. Uh, they played Robbie Williams' Angels, and they used to when Sean were on leave, they used to all go to the pub, and it was around the time that Angels were, were the thing. And they ended up where what 30, 40, 40 young, twenty-year-olds hugging each other, crying on dance floor. Because because Sean wasn't there to take part in it with them, yeah. And it was just, and the whole day had been like so there were no symbolic empty chair. Uh, should, people just realised that Sean wasn't there, Sean should have been you know, Sean should have been. But it all came to head when it was just a, a record that played. And every, you know, these, these weren't these aren't little kids. These these were young adults and every every and they were all crying. All, It's just something you don't do, you don't bury your children. They bury you. Sean had already done his, his eight hour shift at work and he was actually on his uh, rest and recuperation and he was, um, I think he was reading a book or something they said and they wanted to move two majors from one camp to another and the, boy, the, the soldier that was supposed to be going with the radio was actually taken ill so they asked for a volunteer and Sean put his hand up. He, um, they'd, they'd set off and there was only two, two uh, Land Rovers. But the equipment had been fitted wrong because nobody, nobody was sure how to fit it because they couldn't order it until December of the year before. Because to order it before that, people would have known that they were going to war. Uh, it was the same with the, same with the flat jackets, same with the, the uh, helmets. There was some debris in the road. The first Land Rover missed it. And the second Land Rover, because the uh, thermal imaging was set different on the front, missed it and it flipped. It flipped the Land Rover and threw Sean out. He was dead. I am truly sorry about the dangers that they face today in Iraq and Afghanistan. I know some may think that they face these dangers in vain. I don't and I never will. I believe they are fighting for the security of this country and the wider world against people who would destroy our way of life. But I blame Tony Blair for the death of my son because England went to war on a lie. Um, they lied about the weapons of mass, mass destruction. They, they said that they had enough money to, to send them to war. They had enough equipment. I mean, they went without flat jackets. Why? If they're going to be shooting, they need a flat jacket. Half of them wouldn't have died if they'd have had the proper equipment. Indeed, that's one of the reasons why people said that Tony Blair had blood on his hands. Nevertheless, Blair carried on in the face of protest. He lied to me as well as he lied to everybody else, and I believed him. But Tony Blair, manipulated the things that he were given. And when, when he actually 
put things, put put it to Parliament. He didn't tell the truth, and the, if had he told the truth, the the vote would have gone the other way, and the and the the war wouldn't have happened. Almost a year before, Tony Blair knew that he would be taking us to war. We we were listening to the, the thing, the, we believe, listening to the things about the weapons of mass destruction, how they could fire these in 45 minutes, how they could reach Cyprus, and we honestly thought the country were, were under some sort of threat. Although it seems that no one can be held responsible for his son's death, Peter wanted there to be at least a proper inquiry into the Iraq war. The Stop the War Coalition provided the assistance and they attended court several times, but the judge refused permission to apply for an inquiry. Stop the War Coalition couldn't continue in providing any further funding. So Peter paid £11,000 of his own money to fund an appeal. Three judges heard the case. They turned us down and by then, by then there, there were uh, some of the other parents who were involved were, because of their situation, were able to get legal aid. So I took my, I had to take my name off the petition of the court case petition for only the fourth time in the whole of this this system that where these law lords sit, which goes back to back centuries. For only the fourth time, we had they had nine law lords to hear our case, and this this still they turned us down. There is no precedent. It, it's never been done before. Nobody's ever taken the government to court. Peter takes issue with Blair's insistence on trying to change Iraq and trying to impose a new culture upon its people. That's the way they brought up. That's, the, that's their religion. They're, they're quite happy to live like that. And we're trying to say to them, that, that's living wrong. You should, be, you should be living this way, the way that we live. Again, I heard a quote, who invited me to invade your country? In the legal advice, it says several times that regime change is not a legal reason for going to war. Nobody wants our way of life. They want their own. They, they've got their own way of life. They've lived it for thousands of years. Well, they, we, where could, why should we change that? In Iraq, the body count was rising. Thousands upon thousands. And now, a British Prime Minister was being called a war criminal. I've lost my son, and, and, and that is a tragedy to me, but they've, they've lost everything, the, the houses, the, the, the infrastructure of the country, and, and, and thousands upon thousands of people. My son's gone. He believed he was protecting his family and the other people. He used to say, you can sleep easy in your beds, Mum, because we're looking after you. And. Uh, but the Iraq war, it, it, it's not our fight. It's got nothing to do with us, really. And I really, really do feel for the other people that have lost their sons and daughters and are still going to lose them. Because until they bring them all home, that we're going to lose more. One of the lots from Bosnia are, is, on, is going on trial for war crimes, for, for ruining the country and deaths of so many thousand people. And so he's on trial for that. Tony Blair has done exactly the same as up for President of Europe. That can't possibly be right. If, if they have the inquiry and they find out that he didn't do anything, or if they find out what he did and he goes on trial and, and, and he's cleared, then, then maybe he can carry on. How can he possibly, until he's been tried, how can he possibly be President of anywhere? I know there are a lot of disagreements in the country about the wisdom of my decision to order the action, but I can assure you of one thing, there's absolutely no dispute in Britain at all about your professionalism and your courage and your dedication and not just the way you won the war, which was extraordinary, but the way that you're conducting the peace, which is remarkable. The invasion of Afghan of sorry of Iraq as in my opinion, has certainly uh, increased the risk of terrorism around the world. The, the, the terrorists were drawn in. The troops in Iraq are making the, the problem here worse because 
while ever they're there, it's a war. And you know, it, to, 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 us, to me, personally, it's, it's now an occupation. They're, they're into another country that didn't want them, that don't want them, uh, they, and they, they've, they've occupied that country. It's so they've got a base where they can control the Middle East and where they can control the world. Uh, from from the, the resources that are coming out of there, they can, can have some say in controlling the whole world. And that's basically, I think, what they want. And we went along with them. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a futile war. It's all about money and power. And if, the, if there'd have been weapons of mass destruction, maybe I would have thought differently. But we never found any. I don't think we ever will. Seven years have now passed since Tony Blair's invasion. Peter has been trying to meet him for the past six and a half years. Finally, in October 2009, Peter had his chance. Unexpectedly, at a memorial service. It was a non-political event. It was not. It was to, to celebrate the end of the war in Iraq. So I didn't expect it to be there. And so I'd said to my wife, I won't do anything. I'll just, you know, I've, I'll see him. Hopefully one day I'll see him again and get a chance to tell him what I think of him. The last two pages were all the names of the servicemen who had died in Iraq. So, and he was signing, signing autographs and I thought, that's disrespectful. So I went across and I just said to him, Mr Blair, and he turned around and put his hand out. No, Mr Blair, I don't want to shake your hand. You've got blood on it. You've got the blood of my son on it. You've got the blood of the other soldiers on it. You've got the blood of countless thousand Iraqi people on it. Uh, one day you'll have to pay for what you did. I don't want to be in this room with you anymore. And I just walked, turned around and walked away. When he came back, he just said, I've refused to shake his hand. And, and I went, all right. And then this, this lady came that was um, writing, I don't know which paper she wrote for. And she sort of commandeered Peter and said, what did you say to him? And I went, I don't know what he said. And he just refused to shake his hand because he said he had his son's blood on it and all the Iraqi people and the other soldiers. So, but Peter, it's Peter's way of dealing with it. Personally, I don't take a right lot of interest in the news or the papers. There was neither the shock of a physical attack against Blair, nor was there the gratuity of offensive language. But it had a sense of decency, a simple refusal to shake his hand. At the start of 2010, Morning. Morning. the Chilcot inquiry saw Blair continue to justify the bloody war. As I sometimes say to people, this isn't about a, a lie or a conspiracy or a deceit or a deception, it's a decision. Indeed, for politicians, it is just a decision. But for many families, it is a loss. A loss they can never forget. All these snacks that you haven't had, you're going to get. Believe me. And I love him to bits. I love all my kids. Can't say I love Sean anymore, but it's a different one because I can't hold him. I can't. I can't give him anything. Only what's in here. If Craig or Graham walk through that door, I can get hold of them. I can give them a kiss. I can give them money. I can give them anything I've got. I can't give him anything because he's not here. Peter Briley continues to campaign against the Iraq War in the memory of his son. Right. Right. As, as Lindsay says, my son actually died in Iraq, and I, I believe. I, I campaigned for six years against the Ill illegality of the war in Iraq. And when, when they got everything that we wanted, I thought that I were finished with this. This might sound silly to, to you, but if you don't believe, but I can feel him. My son is sat on my shoulder. He's here. And he'll never leave me. Responsibility, but not a regret for removing Saddam Hussein. Come I on. think he was Be a... quiet, please. I think that he was a monster. The decision I had to take 
was given Saddam's history, given his use of chemical weapons, given the over one million people whose deaths he called, given 10 years of breaking UN resolutions, could we take the risk of this man reconstituting his weapons program? Or is, is that a risk it would be irresponsible to take? And I think in the judgment of it's a judgment. It is better to deal with this threat. To deal with